welcome to tonight's episode of Beyond Focus TV. I'm your host, Lydia Patel, and as always, I have a very special guest for you, yeah. Terry Grant, who is a political activist for women, children, and mental health. She's our guest for tonight. She'll be with us for the next 30 minutes, so stay with us. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. Beyond Focus TV allows you to discuss contemporary topics affecting the Caribbean people on both the national and local level. The show features informed guests who offer insight, debate, and evaluate various issues. Beyond Focus TV builds on the station's mission to provide useful information to the Caribbean people in New York and abroad. Beyond Focus TV, where our viewing audience can get educated, informed, and empowered. Welcome back. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel, sitting here with a lovely guest, Terry Grant, who's a political activist for women, children, and mental health. Terry, welcome to the program. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you have such an extensive background, a, a great resume spanning 40 years. 40 years is a long it's time. It's a long yes. time. So you really want to let everybody at home know just what you do, how you got started, and then how they can take advantage of your services. So, of course, tell us how, how did this all start for you? Well, if I look back at my background, uh, I think very early I was aware of a sexist society. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm from Astoria, Queens. I was a very good student. I skipped a couple of years, but I have three brothers, and the plan for my family, which is an Italian family, was that they would go to college, and I would get married and have children. So, and indeed, that's what I did. I did get married, I had a child, but the marriage didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I kind of felt lost and a little bit of shame. It was a long time ago. Even the Catholic Church excommunicated divorced people mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, and I was very fortunate. My older brother uh, was a math teacher in, at the University of Miami. And he encouraged me to go to college. And um, my interest was in psychology. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, no, no. He was math mathematician and we were all good at math. So you have to go to, and major in math, become a math teacher at high school, and that's a wonderful job as a teacher. And so I went along with that program. I was maybe two to three girls in the class. At that time, girls weren't supposed to be interested in mathematics, okay? And as I did graduate and struggle, mm -hmm. I was divorced a single mother, mm -hmm. okay, struggling financially. At that time, we couldn't even get a credit card. And wow. Yes, that's how it was. And, and uh, why was that? that it, what year was that? No, I'm just saying, why was that? Like, I guess they, that was just the system how it was set that, up at the time. That's a part of how the system was set up, and you just couldn't do anything about them, something like that. There were very few daycare centers for my son, so it was a big struggle. I worked as a bookkeeper to get through college. It took six years, wow. yes, at that time. And then what happened in 1963, Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique, mm -hmm. and it was a bestseller. And I saw that the things that kind of, I, did, I don't want to get dramatic, but victimized me. Uh, was happening all over the country for women. There were many women who went to college, were college graduates, and yet they were, you know, geared to be wives and mothers and take care of families. And any aspirations that they had or dreams for a career, that just went, you went know. down the drain. That went down the drain, yes. So. I guess politically and personally, I was motivated to uh, advocate for women and for childcare and for education. And I guess that's how it all began. And it all kind of makes sense now because reading your bio, I'm like, okay, I'm seeing different parts here. I'm seeing you advocate for women, you advocate for children, and then the mental health aspect. But they're all tie in because of the fact that, one, you are a woman. Yes. You had a child, so seeing that there were very limited services available to somebody like you. And then the mental capacity of having to deal with all of this, you know, everyone's kind of against you in the sense that now I'm born in a different generation where it's almost normal to go to college and have a career. But 
40, 50 years ago. Like I look at my grandmothers and I look at even my mother who was still, even when you wanted to go to work, it was a harder time. It sure was. And all along going to school and doing the things I was doing, my family always was like that Greek chorus in the background. If you could only find someone to get married to who will take care of you and your son. That was always the music in the background. And so you were really struggling with finding, I, at least I was, to find my own way. And when the National Organization for Women uh, started the first chapter uh, in the city, and I went to meetings, and then they encouraged me to do conscious raising on Long Island, which is where I was, and they were speaking engagements mm -hmm. to different organizations, and there was a, a huge uh, response to by women to start a Queen's chapter. Mm -hmm. So that started, I think, in 1970, 46 years ago, before the Brooklyn Queen's chapter right. uh, uh, got together and made you know one chapter. So we started out and. We were in Queens. We had the first Queens Boroughs Women's Rights uh, Day. Mm -hmm. um, we um, we did a lot of things. There was a, a statue in front of Queensboro Hall called Civic Virtue, mm -hmm. and he had a sword, and his feet were on the ha on on the necks of two women below, lying below. Yes. So we protested to have that removed. And Queens now sent me out to the national conference in California. And there were only maybe 15 people, women from the East, who went there. And they approached me because they wanted to have someone on the national board who was for education and children. And they actually campaigned for me. It was, they were amazing. How did and that make I, you feel? Oh my God! They got when they got when I got elected to the national board. I just couldn't believe it. So, eighteen months after that, every month, I was going to board meetings in Dallas and Albuquerque and Seattle and Chicago and Atlanta, you name it, and meeting amazing women. Uh, I'd meet women from the South with their southern accent, who knew more about legislation and politics than anyone I ever heard in New York speak, whether it was woman or a man. So that really raised the bar for me, I would Absolutely. say. Absolutely. And when you hear things like that, looking back at this 46 years ago, or even longer than that, mm, is that sure. something you could have even imagined? Yeah, it just it's just such a different world today of what we were what we fought for, we uh, petitioned for. I went to Albany, I went to Washington D.C. I met Ted Kennedy for women's rights, getting their votes, and uh, it was an amazing time, really. Did to, you ever get any backlash from your family? At the beginning, I did, but as I became more assured about what I was doing, then their respect came for me. It, it changed as I was more uh, secure myself. And that's what happens to all of us. Then what happens is other people, and my brothers and my mother, uh, my mother used to pack up, you know, veal cutlet sandwiches for us, me and my friends, as we were going to petition Albany. So. Everybody came along with the program, and I was very fortunate at that time. Very good. Yeah. Well, hold that thought. We're we'll going to take a quick break. You'll be right back. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. Stay with us.
Welcome back. You're watching Beyond Focus TV. I'm Lydia Patel sitting here with Terry Grant, who's definitely been doing such great work as an activist over 40 years. That's mm -hmm. a long time. You've really gotten to see four decades actively seeing how they was in the 70s. 80s, 90s, and now in the 2000s, and such a dramatic difference. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to women now? Well, the first thing I would say is stop making the to-do lists. Stop multifunctioning. Stop making a to what do I want to be list. That's oh. the important thing here. And what I saw was is one of the biggest impact in terms of women's liberation is what took place with the media campaigns that we held. There were hundreds of us for over a year that documented TV, radio show shows mm -hmm. to see the image of women. And we had people like Ethel on Archie Bunker, who was a fearful, senseless woman. We had um, uh, Lucille Ball, who was always in trouble and and not really making good decisions. Um, um, we had a program called Fathers Knows Best with um, Robert Young, and his wife, of course, you know, always, you know, looked to him for all the answers. So we had no female heroes at that time, it's and very true. we we confronted and set up meetings with the networks, the TV, yeah, Channel 2, 4, 7, 11, and we brought our surveys and our documentation to them. And at that time, women could not even anchor a news program because the newscasters would say, uh, or the networks would say, uh, well, they won't be credible. And you see what's yeah. going on today. I mean, for the debates, we have women who are asking the questions to nominees for presidents. So things have changed. And I think the education of the American public really uh, uh, happened because of the media, the changes in the media. And that certainly happened uh, with... Uh, uh, women of color as well. It was right? definitely difficult. Yes. It was difficult because um, it's funny, there's a movie Anchorman. And when I watched that, um, you know, it's set in the 70s. Mm. And, you know, they were laughing at the first lady who got appointed to be a female anchor woman. And they they didn't give her any credit. You know, they always joked at her. They made They made it really difficult. So let alone, and that's for a typical white female, so let alone uh, any ethnic Latino or black or any other ethnic group women, that would be very, very difficult. That would come much later before you started seeing Asians on t TV or Absolutely. Latinas on TV. I mean, Oprah pioneered. She basically had to kind of pave her own way. She sure did. Because the writers and the producers at that time cast women in such sub sub uh, subservient roles. And... That all had a change, and we, we fought for that. Young women aren't so aware of this today because they just Very accept true. that. They haven't gone through the, uh, uh, the times in their life where they had to struggle, and so many are unaware of the wage difference that's still I was just going to talk on. about I was just about to talk yes. about that, how there's still a disparity. Yes, something like 80. 73 cents for of every dollar or something like that and that women over the course of their careers will lose an income anywhere from a hundred thousand to a million dollars that's a lot of money and what do you think could be really done about this because it's still going on although a lot of companies say depending on the position it's only certain sectors that it affects you know depending like if you're a mcdonald's worker everyone gets the same rate male or female they're not allowed to pay you something different based on your sex, but yet it still happens all the time. It's still going on, and that's what we have to be aware of. We can't think that things have changed so much that we don't have to look at the abortion bills are coming up again with the Republicans. I mean, a woman's right to choose.